remains as important as ever, and I hope it's something that we're able to resume very soon. Um, I'm particularly won. interested in seeing venue reform, and I wondered if you would agree that forum shopping has distorted the landscape of patent litigation in many ways, and do you think there needs to be reform to prevent patent trolls from abusive forum shopping? Yeah, tell, ask her that question. Thank you very much, Congressman, for that question. And um, as I testified before the House, I think it's probably a little over a year ago, what I said in that testimony still holds true now, which is I think that any opportunity to reduce the uh, opportunities and advantages of forum shopping would be advantageous and we should consider. So uh, uh, I know there are various pieces of legislation that are pending that have been introduced. The administration has not yet taken a position on any specific piece of legislation. But really, having litigants adjudicate their patent disputes in courts where they have meaningful ties makes a lot of sense. And this should be one of a number of proposals that we consider as we look to strengthen our already very strong patent system. What type of impact do you think um, reform would have on the broader landscape? Um, and particularly on market forces that drive patent legislation today. Um, are you talking about venue reform? Or are you venue talking reform about broader reform? Well, I think um, as to venue reform, if you eliminate the opportunity for gamesmanship, that has advantages at every stage of litigation. So um, I know a number of the proposals in the previous pieces of legislation that were introduced dealt with discovery and dealt with summary judgments and attorney's fees. But if there are no opportunities for game gamesmanship, basically you end up in a court and um, you have a, uh, a court that's equitably deciding all of these issues, that influences the management of the case throughout the entire case, from uh, the summary judgment stage to the discovery stage to the damages award fee stage, and uh, is again, I think one of the things amongst others that we should consider in terms of uh, avenues to potentially strengthen our already strong intellectual property system. Thank you. Um, I also would like to um, urge your continued work on the interparty, the IPR review process. Um, clearly, the process has not been out without some controversies and difficulties, but I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about what you've been doing to ensure patent quality through the IPR process while also ensuring, ensuring that the process isn't abused. Yes, thank you very much for that question. Uh, the Patent Trial and Appeal Board proceedings are a critical piece for ensuring that we have quality patents in our system. I've launched an enhanced patent quality initiative which is meant to focus on making sure that the USPTO issues top quality patents before it leaves our office. But as to the patents that are already in the system, the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, as Congress intended, as you all intended, was meant to be a quality check. Are there patents in the system which under today's law should not be? And if so, the public has the opportunity to bring that back to the agency with a panel of three technically trained judges who are steeped in patent law to consider whether or not the patent should, or certain claims should remain, or whether or not they should be invalidated in light of uh, the arguments presented, the prior art references cited, and so forth. So it is serving, as Congress intended, as a means of providing a faster, lower cost alternative to district court litigation in terms of testing the validity of the patent. Uh, we have about 269 judges on board. Many of them come from our regional offices, super talented team, and we are making sure that these proceedings are as effective and fair as possible by continuing to revise the procedures as we get input from our stakeholders and from the people who use the proceedings. We've issued new rules, um, fine tuning the uh, rules governing the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, and I continue to say that I remain open to any and all additional changes that the public, in a consensus-like manner, tells us we need to make, provided it's within the statutory mandates of Congress. Um, you mentioned the Enhanced Patent Quality Initiative, and I wanna applaud you and the PTO for launching that. Um, and the GAO's findings indicate there's more work needed to be done to ensure the quality of patent applications that are approved. And can you give us an idea of how you measure quality and how you look at that? So, because those metrics are going to be important in t understanding whether the program is successful or not. Yeah, of course. Um, so let me just step back a moment and address the GAO quality report. I want to thank the GAO for the work on this issue that I care very deeply about, which is patent quality. The GAO made seven recommendations on enhancing patent quality, and we agreed with all seven of them. In fact, even before the GAO report published, 
the PTO already began working on issues addressed in all seven of the recommendations. In some cases, we had been working on these initiatives for a year or more, and we appreciate the GAO's acknowledgement of our good work in this area. Now, we recognize we have more work to do, and the USPTO is fully committed to continued leadership and enhancement in this critical area. On your question about measuring patent quality, one of the key prongs in our Enhanced Patent Quality Initiative is to improve the way in which we are measuring patent quality. And we had a, uh, we held a patent symposium and we got input and one of the key issues we discussed is, look, there were 2,200 attendees. How can we improve the way in which we are measuring patent quality? And we got a lot of feedback. They made s some suggestions about how they wanted the current way that we, or the, the way that we used to measure patent quality modified. And that's what we've done. We've taken that input to heart we are modifying the ways in which we measure the patent quality. For the most part, they like the seven subcomponents that fed up to our quality composite. We're going to keep those and we're going to look for any additional factors that are good measures of patent quality. Also, uh, we are working on a master review form which measures for every statutory requirement for patentability, how did the examiner do on each of those, including on clarity of the record. And that will be a very powerful tool uh, and we've gotten extensive stakeholder public input on that, and it will generate three to five times more data when we are electronically recording all those data points so that we can then go back and precisely train certain art units, certain technology centers, because we will have statistically significant data to be much more precise uh, on our trainings and areas for improvement. Thank you. Um, I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I now ask unanimous consent that letters addressed on the subject of this committee from the Consumer Technology Association uh, be placed in the record without objection so ordered and another one from the Internet Association be placed in the record and again without objection so ordered. We now go to the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Goodlatte, for his questioning. Oh, I'm sorry, you're right, I did go to you, uh, Mr. Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Lee, thank you for your testimony today, and I appreciated your response to the earlier question about how your post-grant uh, rules are working, and I know you're still sort of waiting for that to shake out. Um, I wanted to ask you more broadly, and you spoke broadly, and I'd like to ask you to be more specific as to what other improvements you feel are needed uh, for the America Invents Act. And by the way, I won't take any suggestions personally. Well, let me see. I mean, a lot of good was achieved out of the AIA <laughs> thanks to your leadership and the leadership of many in this room, including the establishment of the regional offices. I can't tell you what a success that has been for our agency and our innovation community. Um, the, uh, the, first, the change from the first to invent for the first to file was a necessary step for the harmonization. And of course, the AIA uh, Patent Trial and Appeal Board proceedings uh, are providing the faster, lower cost alternative to district court litigation, so. What, what improvements or changes would you like to see? Well, I think, um, well, on the patent trial. With, within reason. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, on the patent trial and appeal board uh, proceedings front, okay. those are complicated proceedings, and the USPTO did a very good job of taking a first crack at implementing those proceedings. All sorts of procedural determinations, uh, fleshing out and uh, filling in some of the details that we needed to do when we implemented them that were not included in the statute. And over time, we got experience with these proceedings. We got a lot of input from our stakeholders. And one of the first things that I did uh, in my job as head of the agency, even before I was sworn in as director of the USPTO, was to engage in a multiple city listening tour to find out how we could improve those proceedings to make sure that they were as effective and fair as possible. And we got a lot of input. So an ongoing process. It's an there. ongoing process and with our rulemaking and with our taking into account the input that we get okay. from the users of our system. And uh, I think we can continue to you, strengthen You mentioned them. a couple of areas and that's, that's good to hear. Let me jump to an entirely different subject and that is the ability of our uh, innovators, the ability of our uh, inventors to protect their patents in foreign courts. Uh, I think they oftentimes have problems. If so, what can we do about it? Yes, so we spend a good a part of our time and resources making sure that uh, American innovators encounter a level playing field when they want to ship and sell their products overseas. It's in America's interest that we ship as many products and services overseas as possible. And so what we have is we now have, I mentioned our IP attache program in my opening statement. We have 13 IP attaches across the globe. Right. And these IP attaches are associated with 
the U.S. Embassy oftentimes, and they help American innovators navigate the intellectual property regime in various foreign countries. These IP attaches also work with policymakers to help craft legislation containing values and IP values that we share to make sure that there are appropriate protections, remedies, and consequences for violation infringement, all to make sure that American innovators, again, are confident that when they ship or sell their products right. overseas, they encounter a level playing field. Okay. I have one more question, and then I'd like to yield the balance of my time to the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Goodlatte. My last question is this. Um, you face this delicate balance between trying to process patent applications both quickly and thoroughly. Uh, you had the GAO report where 70 percent of the uh, patent examiners said they wish they had more time. What reforms do you envision in the near future being made to enable you to reduce the backlog, which you've done so well, I think you said 78 percent, but to continue to reduce the backlog and process patent applications, but doing so in a very thorough way. What reforms that have not yet been implemented do you anticipate very briefly? Thank you very much. Uh, we are already looking at, and this is before the GAO report came out and before the IG report came out, across our examination core, are we allocating the correct amount of time, the proper amount of time for our examiners to do this very so challenging job? So you're thinking job? about increasing the time allotted? We, I think we, we, we need to remain open. In some instances, uh, more time, in some instances, less, but uh, what we need to do is make sure that we are giving the appropriate amount of time to accomplish this very challenging task. Thank you, Director Lee. I yield the balance of my time to Mr. Goodland. I thank uh, the gentleman for uh, yielding. I just want to follow up on that general area. Uh, the IG has apparently found that some of your employees have quite a bit of extra time because uh, they're <laughs> simply collecting a paycheck and without actually working. The last time you were here, I believe you told us that you have zero tolerance for this type of behavior, uh, which I very much appreciate. In the aggregate accounting for employee privacy, how many examiners at the PTO have you or your staff identified as delinquent, either in the patent division or trademarks? And have you taken any disciplinary action as of this date with any such employees? Yes, so we have taken action for time and attendance abuse. And that ranges uh, anything from, a, uh, from counseling to a letter of reprimand in the employee's file to suspension to termination and repayment of monies paid for hours worked that were not worked. I know during the period uh, during which the OIG conducted his investigation from August of 14 to November of 15, we have already taken action against a number of the employees identified in that group. So we can and we will continue to take all appropriate actions anytime we find time and attendance abuse. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. We, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We now go to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and Ranking Member for holding this important hearing, and I thank the witness today for her testimony, which is quite valuable. Today's hearing is uh, a testament Hank, Hank, to your Hank, could you pull your microphone a little closer? Thank you. I'm sorry. Today's hearing uh, is a testament to your leadership and focuses upon issues that are protected by our Constitution and fundamental to the ability of American companies and inventors to remain competitive in the global marketplace. Under you, Secretary Lee, um, I want to commend you for the improvements that you and your team have made to the Patent and Trademark Office. The PTO was ranked as the best place to work in the federal government in 2013, and you have diligently worked to not only cut cost in, uh, in this post-sequestration environment, but also to improve internal processes so that the patent backlog can be addressed. Despite these improvements, however, there are still some concerns overshadowing the patent office's success that deal with patent quality and diversity. The PTO was once criticized and faced litigation for alleged discriminatory practices in its hiring and promotion of patent examiners, especially against African American women. How has the telework program increased, increased the USPTO's ability to recruit and, ret and retain high-skilled examiners from diverse backgrounds? Thank you very much, uh, Congressman, for that question. And I have the privilege of serving as the first woman head of the United States Patent and Trademark Office in our country's history, and it is a tremendous honor and privilege. 
And one of my very big initiatives is to make sure that we are recruiting and retaining the top technical talent that we can get, the top talent across the board, technical and non-technical, across all demographics. And we have mentoring programs. I have the Office of Equal Opportunity, Equal Employment Opportunity uh, Director reporting directly to me, providing me with information on our programs to retain our very critical talent and to recruit very diverse talent. It's an issue that I care deeply about, not only within the PTO, and I might add that within the PTO, we have more women executives than, dare I say, the average in the private sector, and we are looking to recruit and retain more candidates of diverse candidates, uh, of diverse backgrounds into every level of the Patent and Trademark Office. And externally outside the Patent and Trademark Office, one of the issues that I found when I asked the question is that about 15% of the US-based inventors that were listed on the patents were women. And we haven't, we'd like to see more. And we'd like to see uh, individuals from diverse backgrounds taking advantage of programs that we create, like Camp Invention, where we bring elementary school age kids to the camp. They have a, it's a one week summer enrichment program. They learn a little bit about making, designing, building, prototyping, a little bit about intellectual property. And we give special scholarships working with Invent Now uh, as our partner in this to kids from underprivileged backgrounds. Why? Because we can't afford to leave behind any inventor or any potential future entrepreneur. It's that important to our country's future success. Mm -hmm. What's the name of that program? It's Camp Invention, and actually that is just one of the many initiatives we have to encourage uh, all of our citizens to be excited about invention. I would like nothing more than for all of our children across all demographics, across all geographic regions of this great country of ours to, to want to grow up to be inventors and to want to be entrepreneurs. So I can get you a whole long list on issues that we're very proud of, but that there's a lot more work to be done on in terms of expanding the diversity both uh, you know, in terms of our inventor and applicant base, but also within the agency itself. All right, that will be great. I'd look forward to my fellow members of the Congressional Black Caucus uh, being able to uh, know about uh, Camp Invention and participate in it. Uh, as mentioned in the 2016 GAO report on patent examiners, has the USPTO